Hey everyone, Nathan Long here, president of Saybrook University. Welcome to another episode of Saybrook Insights. Uh, before I get started on this particular introduction, you're going to notice something a little interesting. We're recording this introduction a little later, had some technical difficulties, so we're just uh, kind of taking care of business in that way. Uh, but I, I thought I'd call out the obvious as you shift from one thing to the next. Uh, anyway, I want to get into uh, the upcoming interview that you're going to watch or listen to. A recent article in the Biz Journals called out the fact that more and more businesses are turning to apps, coaches, and engagement to support employee health, well-being, and loyalty. In essence, creating a set of differentiators for job seekers looking for the whole shebang when it comes to work-life balance. As per the article, some may think the current struggles of employers face with finding qualified talent was a consequence of the pandemic, but consider the end of 2019 when unemployment was at or near the historic low of 3.6%. Finding top talent was a struggle. By the next quarter, the pandemic sent millions home to work or forced layoffs as businesses uh, and their performance slid. Whether the great resignation, great retirement, or the unforeseen consequences of billions of dollars in stimulus money sent to idled workers, companies struggled to retain existing employees or find new ones. Underlying this transformation was an already growing desire among employees to work at employers of choice. Organizations with a reputation for paying well, nurturing a culture of employees, they could embrace and providing benefits that drove health, wellness, and peace of mind. The big takeaways from that article then stress several areas, including paying larger portions of health benefits for employees to mental health apps and tapping into a wellness coaching model one city uses that supports employees and their wellness goals, future planning, and the like. This last piece is of particular interest to me here in that having a coach someone to encourage, to hold us accountable, makes such a difference in reaching our goals. At a very basic level in my own health journey, a close friend of mine teamed up for three years to lose weight in a different mindful and healthful way. Because of this mutual support, we were able to achieve our goals, kind of hold each other accountable, and share in our successes and failures, including the very horrible recipes we discovered that involved nut burgers ask me another time. That's an oversimplification of the wellness coaching concept, but in short, it demonstrates the point that such an approach can have a powerful impact. What about formal wellness coaching? How does it work? Is there training involved? What research backs it up? Today, Dr. Julie Serrato, faculty member in our College of Integrated Medicine and Health Sciences and specialization director for our wellness coaching specialization, joins us in the Saybrook Insights program. She's known across our university as deeply dedicated to the work of wellness coaching and its integration into various programs. What's also pretty outstanding is the success she's seen over the years and the students that have benefited as a result. I'm hoping to learn a great deal more about the whole coaching phenomenon. So let's get right to it with Dr. Julie Serrato. Well, Dr. Julie Serrato, it is an awesome pleasure to have you here on Saybrook Insights today. Thank you, Dr. Long. <laughs> Before we get started, tell us all about yourself. Thanks for having me. As you know, I am your uh, your your integrative wellness coaching specialization uh, director at uh, at Saybrook University in the mind body medicine department and faculty for uh, going on almost almost close to five years at this point in time. And I'm super excited to be here. What can I tell you about my background to start with? Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? How did you find your way to Saybrook University? Okay, let's take that. But we call that stacking in coaching. Usually there's there's one question at a time. Oh. <laughs> so a little bit of tools right up front. I, I'm from the East Coast, so I'm from New Jersey. And I found my way to Saybrook uh, fortuitously through the, the late Dr. Carrie Phelps. And she was introduced to me while I was still uh, integrative uh, wellness coaching on an integrative care team at a, a health clinic. And our paths crossed and she directed me to Saybrook, which I had not heard of prior to then and was very interested in what she was doing in the accreditation department and, and so on. 
and uh, joined shortly after. But coaching is not my first career, so. Ah, so what was the first career? So I'm actually a cancer biologist by training. I'm a virologist and cancer biologist and was doing uh, brain cancer research at MD Anderson for my graduate degree oh my God. and was hoping to cure cancer as a little kid. Impressive. What got you into that? Since I was a child, I, I would basically loved science and my father was able to get me some microscopes when I was young and they were professional microscopes. So I'd had the chemistry set and the microscopes and would do little experiments at home and just had a really strong passion for what science and medicine could do. And mostly on the, uh, the, the Western medicine side, the allopathic side, and then over time was introduced to, uh, Eastern medicine and what we, was termed alternative medicine at the time, but is now closer to holistic. Right, right. So I want to lean into this a little bit more. I, this is all news to me, so I'm very excited to learn more about your background here. So, so you went to school with the hope of curing cancer, and you got into this. How did how did your path into you know kind of more integrative means? occur while you were doing this? Because you don't often hear of maybe more traditional science-based uh, you know, folks in the in those careers crossing into that, uh, it, maybe more now than you used to, but probably not when you were pursuing the degree. Yeah, not early on, but now for sure. And actually, we have other colleagues at Saybrook that have a similar path. So it was nice to to be in a like a like-oriented group. I started with cancer research and loved the idea of what gene therapy and, and all the research I was doing was able to accomplish, but was always interested in how the whole person was going to react. And I went to a talk at Elephant Pharmacy, which was a holistic pharmacy in California that was very short-lived. Uh, it didn't last, but it it fostered a whole bunch of other types of um, holistic pharmacies. And Vasant Laud, who is a, a premier Vaidya in Ayurveda, the, the Indian medicine, was giving a talk. And he was speaking about Ayurveda and all different types of healing, and I was hooked. And so while I was still in medical education professionally, I went and did a yoga credential, an Ayurvedic credential, acupressure, massage, aromatherapy, anything that I could get my hands on. And I started teaching classes at the same time and, and integrating that into a holistic lifestyle. And then it also touched upon food and, and nourishment. And then that actually led me to coaching because I was doing integrative wellness consulting from both the allopathic and the alternative medicine side. And that weaved into the origins of what the profession looks like today. Interesting. So coming from that heavy science-based background that you were in and then getting hooked by Ayurvedic medicine and medical approach or approaches, Maybe you could answer for me. I, I know Don Moss, our Dean of the College of Integrative Mel Medicine and Health Sciences, we're going to talk in a few weeks and I'm going to press him on this. Um, Ayurvedic medicine in particular, but also across the board, the various integrative techniques. There's not a lot. Maybe there are more now um, clinical trials, things that are showing if efficacy, you know, in terms of their uh, impact. Um what are your thoughts on that, especially as as Western or traditional medicine starts to to look at that more closely? I mean, do you think there's there's growing proof, growing evidence in that space? There is, and the studies have been growing. There was actually pharmaceutical interest years ago. A colleague of mine, Dr. Um, Bob Ulrich, who is in Southern California, was working with some rheumatologists, and so I. I worked uh, in pharma, in medical education, like I mentioned, for rheumatology, dermatology, gastro, a whole bunch of different clinical areas. And at the time, they were starting to uh, investigate the benefits of Ayurvedic herbs with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And this was at least 15 years ago. So since then, the pharmaceutical interest has grown. It's more into nutraceuticals and the herbal 
the herbal aspect and now you can find ashwagandha in your power energy drinks and in different combination vitamins that are marketed it's not branded ayurvedic as much as herbal so you don't necessarily tie it back to the indian medicine but it's it's there and it's it's prominent and it actually reflects the use of it that's expanded in the Western world as well as researchers and organizations and companies that are investigating it financially. So they're seeing some real direct correlations to improved health outcomes using some of these techniques or herbals, uh, if you will. Yes. I mean, turmeric was studied at MD Anderson even when I was, was in graduate school and, and, and using turmeric and other other herbs and their anti-inflammatories, you know, for colon cancer and uh, for other digestive challenges. And that's, that's straight from traditional Ayurvedic medicine. All right. No, that's helpful. I think there's growing, growing interest in this area, of course, nationally and internationally and figuring out how this uh, connects in terms of the evidence is always uh, of interest to, I know many of our faculty and students too, so. And we have an Ayurvedic course too, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll have to have you talk through a little bit more about the curriculum and how some of that interfaces with the work you're doing and with the work a lot of our students are researching. I was remarking in my introduction about what seems to be an expanding interest among employers uh, to adopt wellness coaching whether it's through like apps or personal coaches into their benefits plans. Uh, There was an interesting article in the biz journals just a few days ago. And um, before we talk about the trend, can, can you speak to our audience about what wellness coaching is, what it isn't? I mean, maybe educate us a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is still really an evolving question. The coaching started quite a long time ago with different modalities, but in the the 60s and 70s, coaching started to shift and there were more motivational speakers that would call themselves coaches and life coaching got branded back then. Tony Robbins and and other really famous motivational speakers were looking really at that type of coaching. And over time, the, eh, it's really kind of a, a global issue, but the growing challenge with clinical and, uh, and health issues, and particularly cardiometabolic disorders like prediabetes, diabetes, hypertension, and uh, all, anything related to obesity and the growing, the growing changes in our, our ability to really be healthy, both digestively and through our cardiovascular system, demanded an extension from physicians and nurses into the educational arena and the lifestyle behavior arena. So from that, health and wellness coaching, health and wellness advising, health and wellness counseling started to pop up. And that was showing up in physician's offices and uh, clinics and then mainly in corporate wellness, which is where my background uh, primarily, primarily comes from with the coaching. As we were doing this type of health coaching and governed by a pretty reasonable scope of practice, which I can get into. Two organizations rose to to the the forefront: the uh, International Coaching Federation, the ICF, and the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching, which branched off from the ICF. And the ICFs developed the initial core coaching competencies, and then the board said, "Well, we have additional in populations of individuals who need a little bit more health and wellness background." Speaking to that clinical need in in the healthcare arena. So from that, health and wellness coaching evolved and is really, uh, the profession is really governed uh, and being elevated by the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching and all they're doing to help coaches be identified as true members of a care team, whether it's in a clinical setting or a corporate setting or a payer organization or through digital health they're going, they're going out of their way to make sure that uh, coaches can get recognized and can get CPT codes and other things to be reimbursed. So the profession is trying to go towards credentialing uh, to a licensure, just like acupuncture or um, registered dietitians, <clears throat> but we're still in that, <clears throat> excuse me, we're still in that evolving stage. In that evolving stage. So, so at, at its core, how would you define wellness coaching for you? Like from your program's point of view, your specializations perspective? 
So Saybrook is really unique. We have an integrative wellness coaching program that speaks truly to the foundations and the core competencies of behavior change. So ideally, because we're dual accredited by the ICF and by the National Board of Health and Wellness, we focus on those core competencies to teach students how to support individuals with behavior change, no matter what their topic or goals are. Okay. But from the wellness coaching perspective, we have that unique mind, body, spirit approach, as well as a health and wellness background that we integrate into the program and allow for educational opportunities, as well as coaching practice and very strong feedback to shape the coach and to help them understand how to work in different arenas to make them an integrative wellness coach. And that's where it's really special with that definition. Oh, that's very good. That's very good. So we, we've really taken it and made it our own in a, in, in a very unique way, it sounds like. We have, and it's really helped being dual accredited to, to hold ourselves to two, uh, two national international standards and to, to marry those and to be able to, uh, to grow with what we want to do with Saybrook's vision and, and mission as well. So I think it's, it's really unique our program and it's being recognized as such by both in organizations. And just to put a plug in here for Dr. Serrato, not only does she run the specialization, she was just acknowledged with a university wide president's excellence award by her colleagues, recognized by her colleagues. And of course me for exceptional service in managing that whole accreditation process. You're running both of those. That sounds crazy. I, and yet you're doing it so well. Thank you. It was, it's a labor of love. I would say it's been going on three, three plus years that we've been in the accreditation process because the standards for both organizations shifted and have really, really changed through COVID times. So the programs look different. The coaching program that we see now is not what the coaching program was uh, four or five years ago. And, um, We've worked really hard collectively. I'm so proud of my team. I'm proud of Saybrook for supporting my team. They're all dual credentialed faculty. They have ICF and board credentials. We have a great mentor program where we mentor our students into TAs and then into faculty and they're credentialed. So they've just worked so hard to get the program above and beyond and then to be ahead of the game and to try to guess what the next standards will be so that we can continue being in the forefront of the industry and, and the educational front for coaching. That's so cool. That is so, so terrific. And um, yeah, so much hard work. And and for those who don't know, the, the accreditation process, regardless of the professional uh, area that your one is in it is rigorous and this is no, no less the case. And I think this for me, is an important point to stress, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, right? So, so in the past, I know I was talking to a, my wife has a friend of hers, we won't get into names and all that stuff, but, you know, this individual was calling themselves a coach and doing all sorts of stuff, but had no certification, no training. And, and I asked my wife this several years ago, um, what do you think about that? She goes, well, I have real concerns because there's the, the possibility that, this individual is giving really terrible advice and there's no ethical guidance. There's no education and training. And these two organizations that help accredit, you know, coaching it really speak to the education and training that goes into it. So as a long winded way of me getting to the point of asking you, what does it take to get everyone trained up or educated? What, what does that look like in different areas? Right. You know, so. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a very long question. I, I can try to, to summarize that. It, it it probably boils down to what you're speaking to with respect to scope of practice and delineating the boundaries and what we call the hat of a health coach versus the other roles or other areas where you're credentialed in. That's one of that's, that's one of maybe three big things that we, we have to to teach students and even even faculty as they they come into the program because we have highly trained individuals who are phds um rds rns mds you know lcsw you name it everyone has a million credentials and then you're saying okay well you have to forget all that now you have to be a coach interesting 
and you have to abide by <laughs> these guidelines and this scope of practice and you have to focus on behavior change without giving advice but yeah you have to have enough knowledge to know what they're talking about <laughs> so so you literally have to take the hat off that you had on as an md let's say and put on the coaching hat, and you can't really yep those two can't really cross that's interesting Yes. And so uh, one of our, our faculty, Dr. Robin Dickey, who was a student that went through the mentoring program as well, she has a fabulous way of describing this because she is a therapist by training and she demonstrates hats coming on and off. And that's one of the ways we, we visualize for the students in our uh, in our residential conference training sessions and our accreditation synchronous hours to get them to understand how to get out of their skin and the roles that they've been in and to relearn or to to learn again in, in a different way, I guess, what they think coaching is. So it, it takes a lot to answer your question. And that's one, one large aspect of it. The other part is really teaching students to listen and be client, let the sessions be client driven. So we mentioned advice and counseling. Uh, with all of this knowledge and expertise and backgrounds, we have the inclination to want to fix and to want to advise and to tell people what to do. And coaches, I had to learn and relearn this and unlearn this and relearn it again a million times. Coaches don't do that. It's knowing that the, the client is whole and resourceful and is going to lead you where they need to go because they have all the answers in ourself. And we create this architectural container where we allow them to be in that space and we hold that space for them as they walk through the journey of the session to find the next step. Got it. Got it. That's, that's very humanistic actually too, right? I mean, that really flows into that humanistic. It yeah. is. Yeah. I'd like to, to kind of understand, and I know there's probably a, a, several different ways uh, to, you know, get to the same end point, but you can train to be a coach probably through a center. You can get your certification or not your certification, but you can take the coursework to sit for certification like through Saybrook. Maybe could you explain a little bit about the Saybrook specialization, what that entails for someone coming into Saybrook and what that can lead to? That would be helpful. Sure. And it, it kind of speaks to what you were saying with someone else calling, you know, your friend's friend calling them a coach. Uh, so, Originally, as I mentioned, when coaching was a term that was more widely used, people would just say, I'm a life coach, I'm a health coach, I'm a, you know, any type of coach that they want. And then programs started popping up around there to say, oh, we'll, we'll train you as a life coach, we'll train you as this. And people subscribe and, and go to those programs, and then they are certified in whatever specialty or area that is. What the ICF and the board have done is help really evaluate those programs, align them with the definition of coaching, and then accredit those programs like Saybrooks so that we can say, as an integrative wellness coaching program, you will graduate with a certificate and you will be a certified integrative health an, sorry, integrative wellness coach from Saybrook. Then you can go on to gain the credential of an ICF credentialed coach or a national board of health and wellness and BHWC credentialed coach. So we are one in the step, we are one educational piece in the step for them to becoming um, professionally credentialed. And that's what sets people, that's what sets us apart from the people calling themselves a random coach. And it, it counts for a lot, I would think, especially as people are looking more for those in terms of employers and the like. It does, and that speaks to your first, your initial series of questions. So employers want to see that your ICF are board credentialed. Ah, uh, okay. They want that level of expertise. They want that level of assurance that you know what you're you're doing in your field. Uh, they compensate better. They have more opportunities within the organization for the coaches, and uh, we're, we're thankfully moving towards that being really the gold standard across the board. Oh, cool. Okay. So then getting, this is, this is great. We're helping each other segue back and forth between questions here. Cause I was going to go right to that. Uh, yeah, it was in the top of my mind in terms of there are all these businesses, 
organizations, or it seems like a growing trend, I shouldn't say all, that's very imprecise, um, that are adopting wellness coaching and other means. You know, what do you think about this? Is this a trend? Is it, you know, kind of a a fad? Is it something that you think is going to hold? What are your thoughts on this whole adoption of this practice? No, I I don't think it's a trend, a a fad or I mean, there's trends to it. I don't think it's a fad. It's been 20 years in the making. So, I mean, since starting in the coaching field and like, like I said, the early definitions of what coaching is and then watching it evolve and then being part of its evolution, if anything, where I see it heading or trending is to be, especially with health and wellness coaching is to be an integral, integral part of all care teams, whether they're digital health, um, telehealth or uh, in person or telephonic, whatever way you, you see yourself coaching. I think that for the healthcare arena, coaches are becoming essential. Uh, there's just no way that um, healthcare professionals and physicians can support patients with that, the time, the methods, uh, and the effort that coaches put into supporting them because they have a whole nother job to do. Yeah, I mean, They have their their specialty. And so physicians were trying to do dual roles and nurses are trying to do dual roles. And the interesting thing is in, if you look at, um, you know, Duke integrative medicine and, and you look at all the different programs that have evolved in all the different areas, hiring the original health coach crossover was from, wasn't with nurses. So they were looking for in, individuals with nursing backgrounds that then went to a health coaching program. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. But now the trends are more registered dietitian. Um, I'm also a certified diabetes educator. We're now, so we're now CDCS. They're looking for diabetes educators and therapists, and that moves into the telehealth and digital health space. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay, so no, this is that, that, that's very helpful to understand that that piece of it, and I think you know it kind of harkens back to the. Well, you know, the ACA, right? You know, and the medical home model that was, uh, you know, kind of pitched as part of the plan for the uh, Affordable Care Act. And we were so excited at the time. I was uh, president of a nursing and health sciences college. And the exciting piece around that was this focus on, I didn't, they didn't call it wellness coaching, but it was something along the lines of a, a, uh, what are they? Concierge. That's what it is. Yeah. So the concierge. Con- oh, concierge medicine. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the idea would be that they'd walk the individual through, they'd, they, you know, part of the care team essentially to support them in that journey, bring them into the fold and, and support them along the way. Yeah. So, sorry. I thought you were referring to con- to concierge medicine, which has also, you know, branded individualized and specialized customizable uh, health care and that has actually supported health coaches and that's those are the one of the areas that have bridged health coaching because that allowed for people to say hey I want I want special treatment too I, I want a another uh, team member who's going to help take care of me you have a health coach okay what what can they do for me I got gotcha. you okay okay so that's the difference but I, you, you can't help but think that that would improve the outcomes regardless to have the coach on the team to help carry through the, you know, the, the certain health plans, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can speak from experience that it, it definitely improves, improves uh, metabolic outcomes and specifically A1C, you know, for diabetes and, and blood pressure in particular, I've, I've seen the changes firsthand as well as uh, population nurses have been able to uh, look at the data and to start to publish some of that information. Um, And then, of course, digital health companies have been publishing for quite a while uh, what coaches can do for weight loss and for cardiometabolic improvement. Uh, But one of the things you you touched upon was what inspired me to think of being a part of a care team and the importance of that. And that payers are now starting to recognize coaches as uh, non-physician healthcare providers because of the national board's work with CPT codes. So, you know, the, basically the, the reimbursable, the codes that uh, we, they fought really hard to get approved uh, was finally, some three of them were finally approved in uh, January of 2020, right before COVID started and for board credentialed and, and VA uh, credentialed or trained coaches. And so 
Um, the AMA actually recognized that and they're starting to see health coaches as part of that medical team. And that's, that's one of the best things we could have is a, a progression of that so that the industry sees us as you know, for the value that we provide. Yeah, it's vital. I, you know, I, I, there's so much to it. When I was at the Mayo Clinic, I spent about two or three, you know, days touring the Mayo facility, trying to get a sense of what they do really well. And I was so impressed. They had a an interdisciplinary care team and they had a coach mm -hmm. there yep. that was in there. And, and this was back in, I think, 2011. And I thought that was the coolest thing. Um, and the, mo and, and so vital. And I was talking to one of the docs on the team and, and she was saying just how really instrumental that individual was. They were sort of the glue that, you know, bound everyone together. Yeah. Mo most of my support as a, as an integrative, uh, coach and coordinator um, in, a, in a clinic were, um, was from physicians as well as from um, alternative medicine practitioners. So I've worked with a, a care team of 20 plus providers that included optometrists, um, uh, PCPs, um, acupuncturist, um, EAP, dentistry, uh, pharmacy, uh, it, just a giant care team and come together at meetings and have integrative case study management all together, all HIPAA managed and just the best possible care you can get. And that model's since been replicated on small scales and on big scales uh, through either apps and virtual and digital health or through uh, larger organizations uh, who are looking at more payer payer structured care teams. So it's within like Cigna or, or other healthcare and entities, but all with health coaching as, as their glue, all with health coaching being the liaison among the providers. Got it. Got it. That's very, very helpful. So you, you have mentioned you've seen some success in this area. We've been talking kind of around the edges here. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any particular stories that you know, stick out to you as like, boy, as a health coach, as someone who's done this, uh, or as, you know, the students you've had the privilege of teaching, anything that kind of pops out? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I worked with several patients, so everyone is, is private and de-identified, de but patients who would spend time coach, you know, in health coaching with myself and who literally um, went from having high A1Cs to a, being a, lower than a pre-diabetic, just on the border of, of normal range, which is a really large feat for someone to do in three to six months. And oh, wow. that had a lot to do with their commitment uh, to their health and their health literacy and health belief and how they wanted to manage that. But it was coming in and talking about behavior change and understanding and listening and trying to help hold that container again for them so that they could find what their goals were and why health was important to them and what was motivating them to get healthier, to lower their blood sugar or improve whatever condition they had. Um, that's where the, the magic came. So I, I feel that's the space that opened my eyes to how powerful health coaching is and for a long time, how really underexplored it has been. Oh, that's so interesting and, and inspiring. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of folks think, you know, the fear of going into the health system, the fear of shame and blame and all those pieces to mm -hmm. it, you know, that kind of, stigma. yeah, the stigma around it. I, how do you, how do you avoid that? I, it sounds like you, you've kind of been in and out where you said you, you, you've had to re reteach yourself, kind of reorient and cause you're, it, 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 Julie, Julie is super healthy. I know this. I, and I know you, you practice such a great lifestyle. Thanks, Ethan. Um, I, I aspire to be. Let me hide the candy. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Candy's gone. Liquor's over there. We don't see it. No, I'm teasing. So so explain maybe a little bit about that journey for you and, and also for other practitioners. Because I would imagine if you're leading in that lifestyle, you're living in that lifestyle to see someone who's not healthy and not in that space and struggling. It is probably like, come on. I mean, like if you, if you're going to do this, you gotta, you gotta do it and you gotta find ways to encourage. So it, it, the, the best way that I found to do that is something that we, we actually teach our students now is to come in with a complete blank space, like blank slate, like, you know, nothing. So you're not coming in with judgment. You leave your 
your thoughts and expectations behind. It's not about your goals as a coach. It's not about your lifestyle. It's not about you, period. It's about understanding who's in front of you or who's on the phone with you or who's chatting with you in the app, What whatever they're saying to you. And that's where the skill of active listening comes in so much with coaching. You need to just hear what they're saying. You, you need to hear what they're not saying and you need to hear what you think they're saying and then you need to stop and you need to ask them because what you think you're hearing is not necessarily what they're feeling and that's that's the switch so whatever bias you have that you're trying to lead them towards or you think they should be doing you have to drop that and say tell me tell me what you think tell me what you feel and and that's where those open-ended questions come in and that exploration and get away from the advice giving. Yes. And just hear and listen at first. Yeah. One of, one of the things I, I say a lot to my team, to my students, to the industry is that with, without a doubt, especially in, in my background. So years ago when I was doing integrative wellness consulting, and that's really what I founded for myself. And that was Ayurveda, aromatherapy, acupressure, and, and just general coaching. Um, that was pre-credential. There was no credential at that time. That's really advising and consulting. And a lot of what the industry does right now and has been doing, continues to do, and it's sort of a pet peeve of mine, is like, you don't have coaches. You have counselors or you have advisors. And if you just made that little switch, then it would be totally in line with scope of practice and they would just be equally, if not more powerful. Mm. So you can use coaching skills in an advising session, or you could just be a coach. Um, and they're very different. And we teach the difference in our program at Saybrook. Okay. That's, that's very, very useful. You mentioned the apps that are out there and, and that's kind of tied into these businesses that are, you know, using personal real life coaches, and then you've got these apps. What what's out there? What's good? What's what from your perspective? What's been kind of best in class? I am biased. I love digital health. So I was using telehealth uh, in my in my corporate wellness before digital health and apps came out because I was privy to technology um, that was unique to corporations who designed it. So I was doing video coaching before it was a, a thing. And uh, so I was doing in, in person, uh, telephonic and video coaching. And, and then apps started popping up and I went into the digital health world and namely creating learning and development and training and strategy and UX design. And I feel there's a lot of benefit to having a health coach at your fingertips. And, and there, there are many, many good companies out there. I don't know if I if I plug them or not, but <laughs> there's a lot of them that are, that are out there that are good. And, and there, there are many that are, are not so good and they need to, to learn a little bit more, but um, what they have in common is an approach to reach an individual to help support behavior change um, through a digital modality. And, you know, since 2020, I think that sped up, the entire world in terms of connectivity through digital means. And I really see them as the future. Um, the other thing that I've been involved with and also see as the future is, is gaming and, and gamified uh, means supporting coaching and using coaching in gaming. And so I, I actually, I will plug this. I'm actually involved with the, um, a company called Plutonic and they focus on games in health coaching and, but not just uh, cardiometabolic space, but for um, DEI and for uh, mental health and all, all different arenas. So I think coaching is applicable across the board and apps are a powerful way to deliver that. Plutonics. Okay. So that's, that's one I'm putting in the back of my filing cabinet. <laughs> sure. All right. So as we kind of wrap up and come to a conclusion here, let's talk a little bit more about the specialization and program. So what what advice would you give to interested students who are considering a you know path into wellness coaching and or integrative medicine at Saybrook University? What should they be ready for? I think they should be ready to to forget everything they've learned before and open their minds to a new opportunity to understand what we have to teach them and how they can learn from their fellow students 
<clears throat> and what they have to give each other. Because everyone in, in, in our environment, I truly believe in I think a lot of other faculty do. Everyone is a learner. Everyone is a teacher. And so we have the chance at Saybrook to go and use that uh, reciproc you know, reciprocative uh, relationship. And I would like them to just step in with a clean slate and just be ready to work hard and learn something that they might not feel comfortable with, but see how it resonates with them and, and then decide if it's right for them and where they might use that in their life. And, and what's on the horizon for them if they graduate from your programs? So we have students from all walks of life. Some come in for just the educational knowledge. Uh, many come in to go on and be ICF or board credentialed. Some of them just want to go off and start their own coaching practice. And, but then, as I mentioned, there's a whole subset who just want to learn how coaching can help them in their current profession. Well, you know, how coaching skills can enhance what they're doing already, whether it's with patients or whether it's in their their boardroom. It's it's really all about what you can do with behavior change. That's okay. That's good. Great advice from Dr. Serrato on the program. And if you're an older student and not, you know, I should say more experienced older student, someone who's coming back after a while of being out. From your perspective, why is Saybrook a good choice? Because we're so open-minded and so embracing. I, I think we have such amazing students that come here and the faculty, and it's just a world where it's focused on the individual finding themselves through education, through community, through connection, through self-exploration. This is just a, a lovely, lovely uh, environment that you and everyone has built and it's just a place where you can grow and and share yourself yeah it's such a great way to put it i i think we should bottle up what you just said and put that out there it's it's perfect i i know a lot of folks who are coming back you know my wife's going back to school after oh, yay. some years yeah Fun. and uh you know but it's it's you know a little terrifying i think for folks who are just thinking about it and what always amazes me is how well you take care of our students, you personally, and then I know our faculty. It's um, It can be scary, but it's also, like you said, if you come in with that blank slate and you're excited about learning something new and just opening up to something different. Yes, I think Saybrook faculty and staff go the extra mile to take care of students. We know they're adult learners. We know they're individuals who have a lot of experience in all walks of life. And just because they've come back to school or have started school to learn something new doesn't mean that we're not going to help them balance. And that's key. I mean, learning is changing. The brick and mortar institutions are not the same. And I'm, I'm seeing such a a series of platforms emerging on, on the web and, and other areas that are changing the way we define learning and speaking to all different types of learners. And that's really, that's really exciting to see. And Saybrook is one of those institutions. All right. Well, we have the last two questions, Dr. Serrato, the quick takes. Okay. Yes, the fun ones. Well, they're all fun, but... All right, so so everyone wants to know, what does the term humanistic mean to you, Julie Serrato? One of the things I think of when you say that is connectivity and the inner self. And in Vedantic philosophy, you have the different koshas or layers of the body, um, body, mind, spirit, intellect. And the end, there's just this one unifying piece and how you relate to others and when we look at that humanistic perspective we're going through all of those layers all of that mind body spirit and getting to the heart of who we are and energetically what we're connected so humanistic is serving all of those pieces so that's that's what i like to see it as there has not been a bad answer yet and yours was like a plus cool <laughs> And the last one, what are, so, so we, this is coming from one of our premier nationally renowned health coaches and Dr. Serrato and faculty members. Tell us a little bit here, just three key takeaways that someone can do right now in this moment to improve their health and well-being. 
listen to yourself. So take some time each day to listen to your body, to your mind, to your spirit. Uh, nourish yourself once you identify what you're hearing that day. And stay connected with whoever you think or whatever you think makes you you and enhances your identity and your your nourished spirit. Love that. All right. Dr. Julie Serrato, wonderful job. Thank you so much for coming on here today. We really appreciate all that you do for the university and for our students. Where can people find you on the interwebs? This is amazing. Thank you, Dr. Long. I, I love being at Saybrook. I am mostly on LinkedIn. So I, I we've been doing a lot of posts lately and there's a lot of interaction going on. So I would say mostly on LinkedIn and then also at Saybrook email. So we can do that. And I think we also have a couple of web pages coming up for us and biographies at Saybrook. We do. So find me on LinkedIn on the inter, on the interweb All right. and this podcast. But thank you so much for having me. This was really a treat and an honor and just so fun to really explore and expand on Saybrook. Go Saybrook. <laughs> Yay, go Saybrook. And uh, yeah, it, I, I've remarked to others that it's been such a rewarding time for me to just have sit down time with faculty to learn more about what you do. We have folks who do so many interesting, but very divergent things as a, an educational sociologist. There was always that one thing, right? But you've got so many talented people across multiple disciplines. It's just awesome to learn what you do and how you do it and how you serve our students. So thank you. Let me know when we get to interview you. Okay. <laughs> Will do. All right. I want to thank Julie again. I hope you enjoyed her as much as I did. She was pretty fabulous. Uh, if you want to see the YouTube version of her video, please visit our Saybrook YouTube page. And if you'd like to support the podcast, go to Apple iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review. And subscribe so you can get episodes as they come out. If you're on Spotify, leave that five-star rating and make sure to follow us. You can, of course, subscribe to us on most major podcast platforms, including Google, Stitcher, Pandora, and others. Remember to check our show notes for information on Dr. Serrato, including links to her website, books, and the like. For more about our university, go to www.saybrook.edu, click on areas of study at the top of the page, and locate the program of your choice to learn more, or simply Google Saybrook University. Thanks, everyone. Take care.